Hello, my name is Pastor Teresa Barrington and I'm at the Christian Church in Windsor, Colorado. And this is our online service for April the 18th, 2021. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about power, power. Uh, there's man's power, call it manpower, and there's horse power, horse power, right? And then there's God's power. And which of those three do you think is the most powerful? Of course, it's God's power. In fact, uh, right now in the in the timeline of when Jesus had uh, died on, on Good Friday and he rose again on Easter Sunday, we're two weeks in to after he's come back to life and he's appearing to people, he's talking with his disciples, and uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight to you is that there's quite a few times that the, if you look at the end of each gospel, where you get a little clue about some of the things that Jesus was saying to his disciples. The first one is at the end of the book of Luke. Uh, so this is uh, chapter 24 and verse 48. It says, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus is telling them, uh, pretty soon I'm going to return, but when, when, I'm, when I'm there, I'm going to send back to earth a part of me. I'm going to send back my power. And what does, what kind of, what does that power look like? If you go to the, the book of Mark at the end of that, chapter 16, here's some of the things. Starting in verse 17, it said, And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. That's one thing. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink a deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Now, those are things, that's just a short list. There's a whole bunch of other things, I'm sure, that the power of Jesus can do for us. But uh, the key is how to receive that power from God and then also how to use it appropriately. And that's part of what we'll be going over today. So I just want to welcome you to our service. And uh, if you're a person, you're feeling kind of weak today, this might be your message uh, for some power, right? So let's open up uh, with the word of prayer, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, you truly are omnipotent. That means you are the most powerful. You are uh, able to create things with a word. And so we submit ourselves to you in this time, Lord God. We ask that you open up our minds that we can understand more of who you are, what you're doing. We ask that you open up our hearts that we can feel your love and uh, the emotion that you want to have expressed. And, and Father, above all, open up our spirit to meld with your Holy Spirit, the source of your power. Um, at least the, the, the source of your power, I should say, is love, but the, the evidence of it. Uh, comes through the Holy Spirit. So we welcome you to this service and ask that you'll come be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we are, we're continuing our Bible tour. Uh, like we said last week and every week, I'm so amazed that this book contains God's story. Of course, there's a lot of other stories, but his story is woven through them all. We have made it to the book of 2 Kings. It's uh, the 12th book in the Bible. That means we have 54 yet to go in our tour. And so for those of you that haven't been with us, we've uh, been doing one book of the Bible every single week. And uh, of course, I can't preach on the whole book. It would take hours and hours but uh, we'll have one takeaway uh, for sure. Hopefully that will empower you from the word. So in the first, uh, this, we're in second Kings. There was a first Kings and that's what we covered last week. And that's where we met uh, a man, uh, King Solomon. He was the wisest man, right? Whoever lived, but he did the most foolish thing in allowing his foreign wives to influence him to leave his faith in Yahweh. Then um, we also saw that his son, 
uh, caused a split in the nation. So now we have northern Israel and we have the southern kingdom of Israel. And out of uh, all the 40 kings that are listed in the book of Kings, how they were, how they acted, how they operated, uh, only eight of them actually followed God. Eight out of 40. That's not a very good record at all. Very sad. So today we're entering into the book of 2 Kings. You're going to meet uh, several kings inside there, but uh, we actually are going to meet a notoriously evil couple, one of which was the king. And then alongside that, we're going to meet a very powerful prophet of God. So when I said notorious, what do you think of? Uh, like notoriety, right? That's the same thing, but notorious really has that kind of evil uh, feeling to it. Now, if I said what in our maybe more modern history would be some notorious couples, who would you think of? I first think of Bonnie and Clyde, right? Did you think of them? Bonnie and Clyde. Um, they were a famous pair. They were uh, bank robbers. They actually became murderers too. They killed a lot of people. And uh, that was in the 1930s. And then, uh, but if we hop back in the Bible, in the New Testament, there was a kind of a notorious couple, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they uh, wanted to have this reputation of being amongst the Christians, the new Christians, of being uh, generous. And so they took, uh, they sold a field and they brought part of it back, part of the proceeds to the disciples saying that was all of the proceeds, so they lied. And right there, they fell down dead because they were called out for their lie. That's, that was pretty shocking in the New Testament to read something like that. Uh, but in the Old Testament, where we find ourselves in our tour, there is a notorious evil couple. And their names are Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, of all the rotten kings that God and his people endured, uh, some would say that Ahab was the most rotten. He did the most wicked things. And one of the reasons that he did that is because of who he chose for a wife. Jezebel, she was uh, the uh, princess uh, daughter of a high priest for a false god. And uh, she was so evil that she's come to symbolize revenge, maliciousness, uh, immorality and cruelty, uh, that, that's what she represents now. And some Christians would even say that there is a spirit of Jezebel that influences some women to act just like her. So Jezebel, she got Ahab to do uh, many evil things, including one of them was to build an altar in the northern kingdom in the capital of Samaria that was dedicated to the false god Baal. And you can read about that in 1 Kings 16. You also, if you read 1 Kings last week, you might remember that Ahab, uh, he wanted a vineyard that was nearby the palace. It was owned by another man named Naboth. And so he goes to Naboth and he says, I want, I want this land and I'll, you know, I'll pay, you can trade, whatever. And Naboth's like, no, I want to keep my land. So Ahab goes back to the palace and he's kind of pouting. Jezebel sees him and uh, she decides to have Naboth murdered and then Ahab can have his land. So that kind of gives you a clue of what kind of a person she was. Uh, God was not happy. He saw everything that Ahab and Jezebel were doing and so he calls out on a man called Elijah. Elijah to go and deliver a message to Ahab saying, your days are numbered. I've, I've had enough of you. Your days are numbered. So Ahab, he took seriously what Elijah said and he repented, but uh, not for long. And uh, he ended up dying exactly like God said he would. Jezebel ended up dying just like God said she would. Uh, God said that dogs would uh, be licking Ahab's blood and that dogs would tear at Jezebel's flesh. And that's exactly what happened. So to set the stage, now for the rest, let's, uh, for this second overview 
or the overview of 2 Kings. Let's watch the Bible Project video. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elijah. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates the spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. In the capital city of Samaria, it's conquered and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decision. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door. Or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it. He's convicted and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up. Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian Empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends. So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. So Elijah, great name, isn't it? There's some strange names here in the Bible, but Elijah, that's a really cool name, I think. He's a very fascinating person. So again, God saw everything that Ahab was doing. 
He was displeased. He calls on Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite. Now that's not Fishbite. It's Tishbite. And uh, that, I had to look that up because I didn't know what a Tishbite was. But if you look on the map of Israel, then um, there is a, an area called Tishbe. And it's in Gilead. Uh, in Israel and so he must have been born there or be he actually was from there but uh, guess what Elijah didn't choose to be a prophet he was chosen by God but he complied when God called him uh, that's a good message for all of us right there's times when God chooses us for something and we comply or we don't but I'll tell you when we comply with something that God is calling us to there's blessing there's blessing. Not necessarily is it easy, but there is blessing. So Elijah, I think one of the reasons why he was chosen by God is because he was devoted to God. He believed in God. He had faith, especially in the power of God. And one of the evidences of that is that God did supernatural things. When Elijah would ask for something, God would do it. And so that was pretty incredible. But Elijah still, he was just a man. There was times when he was confident and victorious, and there was other times when he was scared, fearful, uncertain. Um, he, he had many victories, but he also had some defeats. He also uh, battled with depression, and he needed to have downtime. So for us, even, even when God calls us to do something, it might be difficult. It might be a struggle, but God was with him and even took care of him many times uh, in his journey. But through it all, he knew that God had commissioned him to confront King Ahab about his behaviors, about leading the people astray, and also then to encourage the people to come back to God, to make a new revival within them, to revive their spirits and return to God. So I think there's something interesting about him. He had this particular skill. You don't see anybody else do it in all of scripture. Uh, uh, so he was unlike anybody else. Let's look uh, in the book of 2 Kings and uh, we're gonna read about this gift, which is the ability to call fire down from heaven. So, 2 Kings 1-7. Uh, this is actually not the first time that he does it, but I think this is an interesting uh, story here. This is uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1-17. through 17. It said, After Ahab's death, remember? He's out of here. Moab rebelled against Israel. Now, Ahaziah. Ahaziah is uh, actually the grandson of Ahab, of uh, Ahab's daughter, and another man um, had a child, and he became king. So this Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and injured himself, fell through the roof. So he went to he sent for messengers, saying to them, "Go and consult Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury." But the the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite. Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going off to consult Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went. So this is one evidence. God listens. God's paying attention to everything we say, everything we think. And he said, because you want to go and consult a false god, uh, this injury wouldn't have killed you, but now it will. When the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, why have you come back? And they said, a man came to meet us, and he said to us, go back to the king who sent you and tell him this is what the Lord says. And he says, they repeat the message again, right? And the king asked, what kind of a man was it who came to meet you and told you this? And they replied, he was a man with a garment of hair and with a leather belt around his waist. The king said, that's Elijah the Tishbite. 
He knew who it was. Then he said to Elijah, a captain of his company of 50 men. Here's where it gets a little interesting. Here comes the fire. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on top of a hill, and said to him, man of God, the king says, come down. Kind of presumptuous, right? Ordering the prophet of God around. Elijah answered the captain, if I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Guess what happened? Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. At this, the king sent to Elijah another captain with his 50 men. And the captain said to him, man of God, this is what the king says, come down at once. Answer, if I am a man of God, said Elijah, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire from God fell from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. Okay, so how many is that now? That's 102, right? So the king sent a third captain with his 50 men. Okay, this guy, I like him. He says, this third captain went up and fell down on his knees before Elijah. Okay, no pride there, right? He's not ordering him around now, right? He says, man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these 50 men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and their 50 men. And now have respect for my life. So the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. So Elijah went down. He got up and he went down with him to the king. Guess what he told the king? It might sound familiar. This is what the Lord says. It's because, is it because there is no God in Israel for you to consult that you have sent messengers to consult Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Because you've done this, you will never leave the bed you're lying on. You will certainly die. So he died, according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. So three times, three times he rains fire down from heaven. Well, two times, I guess. He rained almost three, right? He almost rained it down again. But uh, um, the king died. And, but I find it interesting that the message stayed the message, right? And a lot of times in our lives, God's message does not change. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter who says it. It's still the word of God. And uh, uh, so that's what, uh, I, I just find that an interesting story to open up our book of Second Kings. So his special gift was to call fire down from heaven, but it's not the first time it happened. And that's why I said he, he did it three times because there was another time. If you have been reading, you read in 1 Kings chapter 18 about another time. God really was displeased that his people were um, following after other gods, uh, false gods, because there is no God other than our God. He is the one and only God that's living, right? And so... Um, the, the kingdom actually had been in a few years of drought. Elijah had something to do with that. And he, so Elijah goes to meet with King Ahab and King Ahab calls him a troublemaker. And Elijah says, I'm not, I'm not the troublemaker. Um, and uh, um, God wanted, actually, God actually wanted to bring rain back on the land, except there was just an issue. Ahab hated Elijah and his queen Jezebel hated Elijah too so it was dangerous for him to go and see them he could have just instantly called for the death of Elijah but here Elijah goes in that chapter and he meets boldly with the king and what he's saying is I want I've had enough of this and it's not just me it's God right so meet me on Mount Carmel big you know mound out there and uh he said, call all the people, as many people that will come, and I want all of the prophets of Baal to be there, and, uh, and uh, I'll meet them. I'll meet them there, and we'll see who is God in Israel. So they all meet up there, and this is like a classic drama, you know, uh, uh, like 
the Montagues and the Capulets or the Hatfields and the McCoys, you know, the, the man of God, the one prophet of God against all the prophets of Baal and everybody there watching it and, and him standing there in front of his enemies to see who is God. So they gather on Mount Carmel um, and uh, uh, here I love, I love what uh, Elijah says to them. So 1 Kings 18, verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. It's like, don't be in this middle ground with one foot in you know, on this side, one foot on this side, you're sitting on the fence, right? Very uncomfortable. And nobody knows what you're really committed to. It's like, make your choice, make your choice who you're going to be with. But don't be on, on, on the Baal side and pretend that you are following after God, being God's people, all right? And if you are on this side being God's people, then reject anything to do with the other side. So he's calling them to make a choice. So what happens? Um, See, so he sets up this scene. He's like, okay, I want you to you know, make an altar, kill a bull, put the bull on top of there, and then if, if Baal is God, call down fire from heaven. Uh, you know, call fire down and consume the bull. So all these prophets, they pray and they dance around and they ask their Baal to set fire to the bull. It didn't happen. So they start to wail and they cut themselves. They shout. They do all these I'm crazy stuff, right? No fire. So Elisha, he gets tired of waiting. He starts to kind of taunt them and he's like, Maybe you should pray louder. So they start shouting louder, right? But who did he trust? Who did he believe in? He believed in the living God. So it was his turn to call for fire. And so he, he wanted to up the ante. And so not only did he have them build the altar, um, right? He, he had them put the, uh, the bowl, it was on the altar. Then they had they drench everything with water four times. So it, was, it would be hard to start a fire with something that was so waterlogged, right? Uh, then Elijah's going to call, right? So he has this grand moment. He cries out to God on behalf of the people of Israel. And uh, what happens? Fire comes down from heaven. And not only does it consume the bull, it consumes the wood and it licks up all the water and goes right back up and they're just laying there with smoke. And so what did the people do? You can read it in uh, verse 39. They said, they fell on their knees and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They just kept saying that over and over again. And there was a huge revival. I mean, there were so many people there to witness it. Um, and, uh, and then, the, the heavens opened up and rain ended the three year drought. This is an amazing story, right? It, it's so God, you know, God shows up. Now, have you ever wanted to rain fire down from heaven on somebody? Uh, maybe it's somebody who's an enemy, somebody who's tormenting you, someone who just isn't kind, someone you think, you think, doesn't need to be on the earth anymore. Um, maybe they're taking advantage of you. And so maybe you want to say, hey, God, if you love me, just rain fire down on that person and get them out of here. Well, I suppose that that, that is one way to take care of the problem. But guess what? It doesn't take care of the root of the problem. What caused the contention in the first place? What is the root of contention and strife in the world? Sin, right? When we don't align with God, there's contention. Now, Jesus, at the very end of his ministry, he was headed to Jerusalem. He, was, he knew he was going to be crucified. He also knew that three days later he was going to rise again. And uh, he and his disciples were on their way through Samaria, which is interesting because Samaria is exactly where our story from the book of Kings occurred. And so they're, they're walking through there and uh, 
there's something that happens. And if you want to read it, it's in Luke 51 through 60. That's what I want, 51 through 60. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken up for heaven, up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for them. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Now there's a long history that you can tell clear from 1 Kings uh, that uh, why Samaritans and Jews, the Jews from the southern kingdom, you know, all, all these things, the, the reason that they hated each other. And so they might have liked Jesus for the healing that he did, but they didn't like that he was going to Jerusalem. So they made trouble with Jesus and the messengers. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, verse 54, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Now, how did they know about that? And if you haven't read 1 Kings, you really wouldn't know why they would say such a thing. But now because you know about Elijah, so what they were doing was they were comparing the Samaritans to the prophets of Baal, right? And it wasn't just a sacrifice that was going to be called down, but it was going to call down on, on human beings. But what did Jesus say? He turned and rebuked them. And they went to another village. So Jesus wasn't, Jesus wasn't into that. But let me ask you this, um, that kind of retribution, I should say. Did, could Jesus have called down fire from heaven? Absolutely. He's God, right? He had all the power of God. He was indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. Absolutely. He could have called fire down from heaven. But I'll tell you what, Jesus was far more compassionate than Elijah. Remember Elijah, he did call down fire for the sacrifice, but he also killed 102 men with the fire of God. And they were pretty much innocent, you know, killing the, the messenger there. And um, James and John, the disciples of Jesus, they were raised on the Old Testament. And so their hearts had not yet been softened by God's Holy Spirit. They, hadn't quite, they don't quite understand the full message of Jesus yet the expression of God's love. But they did know the story of Elijah and they knew the power of Jesus, so they were putting that together. So the love of God understands why the Samaritans did not welcome Jesus. He understood why. And um, their opinions were less important than the mission. Do you hear that? The mission was more important. So it didn't matter where Jesus rested. He didn't have to rest there. He went to another village. I'll tell you, opinions really are no cause for calling down or creating death and destruction. And I think that the disciples' question showed that they really weren't ready to wield the power of God. They were not prepared. And I guess neither are we. Unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit of God and our motives are purified, our actions are righteous, and the love of God is demonstrated. Yes, our God is powerful. He's the same today as he was back then. Um, he can part waters and rain down fire. He can shift things supernaturally. He's, about, he's not about death. He's all about life and love and goodness and purity everything that's wonderful. So if, if any part of your heart wants to destroy or cause damage to another person, then you need to, you need to dive in internally, tap into Jesus, and see where you're a little off base, right? Because that's not what we're called to do here as followers of him. Now, why did, so why did God comply with Elijah's request to rain down fire on that, um, that sacrifice and show that he was God? Because he wants people to know that he's real. He does. And he wants the same thing from us today. 
I mean, do you really believe in God? Are you really trusting in Him? Um, or are you more interested in false opinions uh, that are being spewed out by, I mean, the tons every single day by the modern world? I mean, who are you asking if you're going to survive a certain circumstance? If it's a, a health issue or a financial issue or a, a relationship issue, who are you going to first? I mean, are you going to um, seek the advice of other people? Are you going to Google it? Or are you going to go to God first? That would be my recommendation. Even go to God before you even believe your own heart, which has been told it can be deceptive. Our own heart can be deceptive. And so I heard this one thing, uh, too. It said, is God your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is he guiding your life? Or is he just who you go to in an emergency when something's gone uh, haywire? So then the other question is, what is more important to you than God? Whose opinion matters the most to you? So right now, we live in a time of God's mercy. God is being merciful. Uh, you feel it, I feel it, wickedness is, and evil is spreading over this world like a black cloud of tar. Isn't that what it feels like? It's thick, it's pervasive, almost feel like we can't beat it back, like it's going to win. It's like Ahab and Jezebel are running the world again. Um, it's just like, or, or, you know, people like Bonnie and Clyde feel like they can just go around and do whatever they want. Uh, they listen to what the, their own hearts instead of doing it God's way. Uh, but why were they like that? Why were those couples that way? It's because they were just like Adam and Eve. What did Adam and Eve do? They said, we know better than you, God. We know better. And what was the result? We all become just like them. Our tendency is to follow that sin nature and uh, do things that are against the goodness of God. So God is not happy now. He sees it all just like he did then. Not happy. Um, his creation was beautiful and good and it's being destroyed and ruined by humans. And, but he's being merciful. If I tell you he's not always going to be this way. In our Bible tour, when we get to the book of Revelation, we're going to see that once again, there's going to be fire from the sky. There's going to be fire from heaven that's going to rain down. And it's going to be so powerful that it's actually going to burn up the world. Uh, it's a day of judgment. It's a day of reckoning. Uh, almost all the people, all those kings that we read about, there was a day of reckoning for them as well. Their choices caught up with them what to do, what to do about that. Every person has to make the choice of what side they're going to be on. If you're going to be on the side not with God, if you're gonna turn your back on God, then the fire, <laughs> it will consume you. It will consume you, a day of reckoning is coming for you. But if you, you stand on the side with God, yeah, you've probably done is maybe some rotten things. You've made some bad choices. You haven't done things God's way. But guess what? You don't have to face the fire because Jesus is your protector. Jesus is your savior. Jesus will block that reckoning day. And uh, where, what will happen? He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And that's where we will live. So make your choice. What did Elijah say? 1 Kings 18, 21 through 22. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal or people or the government or the doctors or the television or Google or a relationship, anything is God. Follow that. But guess what? What do you say? The people said nothing. And so my question for you today is, what will you say? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, these are just, uh, not just stories, God. 
They are words of power, and they have the power over life and death. God, I just pray if we could just open our minds just enough that we could see that you are everything that's real in this world. You are reality. And you demonstrate that so clearly in your word that we have to align with you. I mean, it's not mysterious. It's very clear. You've said which is the way to go. And now you're setting before us life and death um, in this way, you know, God or Baal. Are you, gonna, are you gonna serve Jesus? Are you gonna be a follower of Jesus? Or are you gonna follow the world? Are you gonna go in the narrow gate? Or are you gonna go in the wide road that leads to destruction? We're asked to choose. And we can't stay just in the middle, riding on the fence, saying, well, I'm a good person. I don't do this bad things. Well, it doesn't, I mean, thank you for being a good person. But what does the word say? That Jesus, is the way to the Father. He is the life. He's the, the way, the life, and the truth. He's the only way to the Father, and the Father is life. Just gotta pray those who are listening to my voice right now to make that decision. If they haven't decided yet who they're gonna follow, help them to make that choice and then go after it. But uh, also for those of, that have chosen Jesus but are kind of getting close to the fence, in the, on top of the fence, or have one leg in the world, Father, pull them back and renew their commitment like the people of God in our story, that they will be revived, they will be renewed in their fervor for the ways of God. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit and let us have that power. We have given in to everything that's not you. We've given in to weakness and illness and sickness and disease and uh, sorrow and depression. Lord, help us to forsake all those things and stand in the power of the Holy Spirit that can bring new life. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Make your commitment. Make your commitment. Stick with it and go with it wholeheartedly. We need to know where you stand. So um, your assignment today, um, you know, for this week, of course, is to finish up the book of Kings. And uh, you could also pay attention now, you know, Elijah, the person that came right after him is Elisha. So Elijah with a J, if you want to ever remember that, which one of them came first? J comes before S in the Bible or, or in the alphabet. And so Elijah comes before Elisha. And Elisha actually does many more things even than Elijah did for the Lord. So yeah, it'd be an interesting study even to compare those two, but God used them powerfully to bring the kingdom back to him. All right, so next week we'll continue on uh, into the book of Chronicles. God bless you, and we'll see you then.